Oh, what? Um, hey, Jeff, thanks for helping my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, Jeff Sims, uh, based in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I think when Nathan approached me about this, my it struck a chord with me because one of my, uh, I was born in 1965. So one of my very first memories, uh, when you think back to things you can remember was gathered, I was four and a half years old uh, in July of 69. So when uh, it's a little fuzzy and gray, but I remember everybody huddled around my grandma's black and white TV and watching Neil Armstrong on the moon. So that's when, when you, uh, sent the invite out to talk about your memories and stuff. I'm like, oh, one of my very first memories is watching Neil Armstrong on the moon. So I thought it'd be a fun thing to get in and, and talk about, so. And, you know, we should clarify uh, because there's a lot of people that probably have no idea what you mean by black and white TV, that we're not talking about the case <laughs> being black or white, but yeah. the actual picture itself was black or white. And it won some type of artistic effect that they were trying to do it was no it was yeah it was black yeah, and i the obviously the signal from the moon was black and white but the tv itself was black and white so because as i recall in those days you had to be uh, we considered wealthy people had color tvs because they were barely a thing in 1969 so but yeah it was the uh, rabbit ears and trying to get the signal to come in correctly and all those fun things from the old school tvs yeah and uh, TVs were so big, uh, they were furniture. Yeah, although in my memory of this, we uh, my grandma had a smaller TV, and that's why we were all kind of huddled around trying to see, because it was probably a 13-inch or uh, sitting on the kitchen counter kind of thing. So we were all uh, kind of huddled around the kitchen trying to watch. Uh, I remember Walter Cronkite and kind of his dialogue as they walked through everything. and. Uh, I remember people pushing each other out of the way to make sure they could see uh, see what was going on. So, um, so what did you think about it at the time? I mean, I know you were four, uh, so people were four years old. I don't remember anything from when I was four. Yeah, that's why I said it's a little fuzzy. I think the thing that sticks out, I had a, uh, from a Swedish Norwegian family and my grandpa was a very stoic, uh, didn't say much uh, type of guy. And uh, I have no memories of him getting <clears throat> animated about anything ever. <laughs> Other than I remember him standing up and uh, telling everybody to hush up and be quiet because we got to hear what Walter is saying. And that that's what sticks out of my mind that grandpa, if grandpa thought this was a big deal, this must be a big deal was uh, how I was trying to process it as a four year old that uh, my my grandpa thought this was a big deal. So I better pay attention and be quiet and <laughs> watch everybody as they were uh, watching the TV. So I think that's, that's the thing that runs through my head as as the why it was a big deal. And later, obviously, when I get older and study it back in school and and remember back to that day because oh okay that's that's why that was a big deal <laughs> so yeah but i guess uh what was the next space event you remember remembering i have a little fuzzy memory of the uh the apollo 13 uh, uh being on the news and everybody worried about what's going to happen with apollo 13 um i think that came back I think I mentioned that in my intro thing too. If you watch the beginning of the movie Apollo 13, they go, they, they have that kind of coverage of the first moon landing. And that's what sparked my memory of my first memories. But the, I don't, the movie obviously may, paints it in a whole much more detail than I can remember. But I, I do remember it being a similar situation where you're huddled around the TV trying to figure out what exactly is going to happen to Apollo 13. But I think the, after that initial event, then it was always a, uh, an event to go watch a launch, any of the launches after that from uh, from Cape Canaveral. So I know that was always a, a big event. And then uh, and then when the space shuttle started, I know it was it was always having kind of grown up in that time. It was always a, a big event to try to stop what you were doing uh, to make sure you could try to watch the uh, the space shuttle launches. And those seem so much with the shuttle on there. They just seem like such a different 
event than uh, than the rocket itself. So it just felt like it was bigger because here's this, you could get your head around, hey, there's a plane on there. And having ridden on a plane, you're like, this is crazy that <laughs> they're launching a what looked like a plane into space. And uh, so I always remember those, yeah, just kind of the making it a, a point of, point to, if I could, get to watch any of the launches. And it always had a, just amaze it. And then uh, years later, I actually went to, it was probably an eighth grade trip. We went to tour Cape Canaveral. I and mean, you can actually see the the building that the, where they put everything together, the, I don't know the actual name of it, but where the, where they house it before the, overnight before they launch it that giant building and i believe the tour they talked about it at the time being the biggest square foot building ever built uh at the time or something and from a square footage standpoint and until you stand next to or as close as you can get to it on the little you know nasa tour or cape canaveral tour there um you get to see it off in the distance and it's like holy smokes you get a sense of how big <laughs> The rocket is and uh, the little um, was the machine that uh, carries it over to the launch pad and with the big uh, tracks on it looks like a giant uh, giant tractor or a giant uh, giant I machine that, yeah that giant bulldozer there you go um, to run it over to the launch pad so that's uh, just everything's so much bigger when you see it in person than kind of the sense you get from TV. So that was that was another memory of kind of making it more real uh, to the point of now, as I got older, as the, you know, the shuttle launches and all that, you could say, hey, I was there. I saw the, I never saw a launch live, but I was able to say I had been where, <clears throat> where all that was happening uh, later when I saw it on TV. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so what do you think about the fact we, we stopped going? I was kind of disappointed myself because um, I'm a huge fan. I, I don't know if it's that generation or growing up. The uh, we had a uh, my senior year of high school. Uh, we had to, our guest speaker came in and uh, Pinky Nelson, George Nelson, I think his name was an astronaut, had graduated from my high school, so he came back. That would have been 1984. So we were still in the middle of you know, shuttle launches, and so he'd been on a, a shuttle mission and. Um, always ad admired those guys and the, the bravery that they showed, uh, to, you know, you're <clears throat> putting your life on the line to get on there. But, uh, when he kind of talked about, you know, expanding man's knowledge and the whole vision of Kennedy in terms of, we don't do things that are easy. We do things that are hard. And, um, you know, I, I gravitate, gravitate towards that sentiment. And I think we've, we've lost a little bit of that in the modern world. And so I love that energy or that vision of you know just because something's hard let's let's not say we can't do it let's go do it and just that any of those people involved in the whole program that uh you know put their lives on the line and guys that actually gave up their life for that pursuit of knowledge and and science and and all the different and i don't i don't think we have an understanding of how many ripple effect things in everyday society uh, came out of, you know, the, all the different things we've learned from, from the space program. And I think it's, uh, people talk about it costing too much money, but if you look at it compared to the overall budget of the United States, it's, I looked once upon a time, it's a minuscule amount of money compared to the overall budget of the U.S. So I don't think the money thing holds any water from my mind and the, the benefits we get from a, a dreaming and a, you know, if we see all the all the billionaire space race that's going on today that uh, all those guys are from my generation and if i had the money they had i would probably be doing the same thing <laughs> in terms of i want to go to space and it would i i'd be excited when it gets to anywhere near regular humans can afford to go i'll be the first one to sign up uh i think so i think i'm rambling now but i <laughs> i just think the um yeah, so your original question was, uh, yeah, I was disappointed that we stopped going. I think the a lot of the satellite stuff and the uh, the Hubble telescope, and so I think there's still activity there, but I just think there's there's something emotional about it when there's humans involved and they're going up there, the, you know, the space station. Well, I don't know, I, how much a gap was there between the space station and when like the, 
the shuttle program ended. We had a yeah, 10, 15 so... year gap in there somewhere, but yeah, there was a, a decent chunk of time where there was no, no humans going up. Well, uh, humans were still going up, uh, just on Soyuz rocket. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it didn't quite, quite make the news here as much when it's a Soyuz <laughs> rocket, but um, yeah, so I'm I'm excited to see that. Yeah, we're is it 2025? We're scheduled to go. We're scheduled to go back again. So I'm I'm excited. And I think that hopefully that generates uh, some of the excitement I remember from a kid for any you know newer generations here that uh, can watch that and. I imagine our ability to capture, you know, high definition photos and have them darn near real time is going to really, uh, you know, people will be, able to, it will be must see TV, I'm guessing, once we can actually, you know, broad, live broadcast from the moon. I can see it on Twitter and somebody's going to Twitter from, you know, social media from space is just something the, you know, Neil Armstrong would have never dreamed of, right? So I think that'll create a buzz and I think that that'll get some more excitement from uh, the younger generations. And I think uh, folks from my generation will, will be excited about it because they'll be able to remember the times when we were kids watching. And... Well, you know, the first moon landing had a buzz too. Yes. <laughs> He's the one that didn't get to go on the moon, right? He had to sit in the capsule. Oh no, that was uh, Michael Collins. That was Michael on the Collins. moon. Okay, Buzz yeah, Aldrin right. and uh, Neil Armstrong were the two people on the moon. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how they picked. Because uh, assuming you want to be the guy that walks on the moon, so did they have to draw straws or flip a coin or who who was the odd man out that didn't get to go actually walk on the moon? Because it'd be really frustrating to be that close and not actually get the step on the moon, right? Yeah, Ed. That is a good question. I'm sure there was a lot of angst about that, but also the acceptance that it had to be somebody. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Do you know the backstory and how did how did Neil Armstrong get chosen? I wonder. Well, my understanding is that um, Neil was pretty much liked by everybody, okay. um, and pretty much everybody was accepting of him being chosen. Yeah. I mean, it's not a popularity contest for sure, but. No, but it's, NASA still wants to have a, you know, he's gonna be a hero, right? So you better be a likable guy. And hadn't he, he had flown uh, space sound records and different, uh, I think he was already, his name was already known in before NASA, I think, in terms of. The, the sad part is um, he never liked the media, you know, the media right. attention. So. <laughs> You know, you would have liked to have somebody that would have enjoyed to be a little bit more public figure. Yep. Oh, well, yeah. I think of that in the modern day now with all the talk shows and the different things that you would be expected to do or whoever goes in 2025 will probably have to come back and do the late night TV circuit and the daytime TV shows and all that kind of stuff to talk about their mission and all that. So that'll be a requirement of the, of the new age astronaut, I'm guessing. But uh, you mentioned uh, about us going back to the moon uh, in 2025 with Artemis. Um, how did you find out about that? Uh, from you. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. But you're like a space fan. You like follow SpaceX and, you know. Um, not to the level that you do. Uh, so I, I think it was just talking with you at work probably was a uh, spark. Yeah, you mentioned it and then I went and kind of Googled it and got some more info, but uh, hadn't followed it as closely. <laughs> more on the, yeah, because I watched the summer, I watched the, uh, when Jeff Bezos went and uh, what's his name from England, uh, Virgin Atlantic guy. Rich, Richard Branson. Richard Branson, yeah. So Sir watched, Richard Branson. Sir Richard Branson, yeah. So I watched those, you know, on, uh, one Branson was on a Sunday morning, and I remember watching that whole thing, thinking, oh, this is pretty cool. And uh, it was a week or two later when uh, Bezos went up. And but yeah, I had not realized that NASA had officially, I knew NASA was busy because I knew, I think I follow Elon Musk enough to know I thought Elon had signed a, a contract with NASA to provide the some rockets, but I guess I didn't put it all together that those were, are those ones geared towards 
uh, the moon land moon launch or is that a separate yeah. thread? So, so basically, uh, the basically the way we're getting to the moon is um, NASA contracted with Boeing to build this this new rocket using shuttle technology called the SLS Space Launch System. Okay. And uh, contracted out with a Lockheed Martin to create a, a capsule uh, for it that could carry uh, that would carry four astronauts. Okay. Um, and the very first flight of that Artemis One is going to be May of this year, according to current plans. Oh, okay. So not too far from now. I think May. Um, and you know it won't have anybody on it. Uh, but then, uh, assuming that goes well, then in 2024 they would essentially um, go around the moon uh, with four astronauts. Yep. And then assuming that goes well, in 2025, they would go around the moon and they would meet up with a commercial human landing system, which SpaceX won the contract to use a derivative of their Starship that they're building in Boca Chica, Texas right now. Yep. That it would meet up with and, and take uh, two of the four astronauts to the surface of the moon and then it would meet back up with the, uh, the capsule. Okay. Um, also, shortly after that, the plan is to put a little space station around the moon called the Lunar Gateway. Mm, and okay. then future missions would have the Orion capsule docking with the Lunar Gateway and the human landing um, system docking with the, the Lunar Gateway. Okay. So that would that be, that wouldn't be permanently manned though. That would just be when there's a mission yeah, that's right. It would be uh, what they call human tended. <laughs> okay. So uh, most of the time, it would probably be empty, and then whenever they're doing missions, they would they would uh, fire it up and fire. Yeah. Okay. And is that does the space station, the International Space Station, have anything to do with the lunar? Other than they're both in space, but are is there are those programs connected at all, or are they independent? Um, I mean, I think I would say that they're independent, though I would say that uh, people who are familiar with the International Space Station and all those systems already kind of have some experience that's relevant to um, Artemis and the Lunar Gateway and, and all that. Yeah, that's just, it feels like you're in the neighborhood. You could uh, stop by the International Space Station, go over to the Lunar uh, Lunar Gateway, pop down to the moon. Uh, you can't really, though, uh, because no. the um, International Space Station is in a different plane mm -hmm. than the um, moon. Okay. And it's uh, really easy to change your altitude in a plane. It's really right. difficult to, to change which plane you're in. Right, right. And in fact, um, what I have under, understand from my very limited uh, study of, of, of physics is that it actually requires less energy to land and relaunch <laughs> to change our plane than it does to, to, to shift uh, like mm. that. Okay, because it's probably a straight line more or more of a straight straight up type of thing? Or Well, you know, you're, you're kind of in, in this uh, orbit that's circling around the Earth in a different plane. The moon's in an orbit and the International Space Station's in a different Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, and different, yeah, different cycles. There's not a, an exact circle, right? It's there's a a certain apogee. Is that the right word that they're using to stay in the same spot? Or well, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you so the the moon orbits the the Earth. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what plane it's in. But I think it's close to, you know, just like four or five degrees. Yep. Whereas the International Space Station is orbiting like uh, something like 30 degrees. Okay. Um, yep. So, um, you know, not only would you have to go out further, but you'd also have to transition to a, a different orbital yep. plane. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but what do you think about us going back to the moon? I'm excited. Like I said, I'll be I'll be sitting by my TV watching on uh, with the things that are getting ramped up. And uh, like I said, I hope it's 
hope it gets more if not more hype than uh, the stuff this summer did with uh, where they're kind of just touching the edge of space because i think the the fact that it's the moon and everybody can see the moon with your naked eye and i guess that's what always fascinates me is you can look up and kind of see the different you know the sea of tranquility or the different spots on the moon and you're like wow somebody was standing on that it has a different tangibleness to it if that's a word <laughs> to see the moon and somebody's there i think when the these other ones where they just go up and kind of touch the edge of space as cool as that would be it's harder to get your head around that because it's like you can't see it you can't see where the edge of space is but you can see the moon and so there's a a tangible thing to get your head around saying oh that's where we're going or there's an actual physical destination so i think that that'll get more hype and more uh, more excitement than some of this other uh, on the edge of space stuff is. So, so I'll be excited, yeah, I'll be excited to see that because I think it'll bring back a lot, of, a lot of memories from when I was a kid and watching the different Apollo, Apollo missions and. But, uh, you know, some people are, are wondering why are we spending so much to send a couple of astronauts to the moon? when we have, you know, X, Y, Z problem and, you know, why aren't we taking care of that? I was just wondering, how do you sort of engage in those types of discussions? I think I touched on it earlier. I think the, um, my own personal opinion is a lot of these issues we have aren't, aren't money related. And I think we've, we've thrown a lot of money at a lot of problems and the problems don't get fixed. So the core issue isn't necessarily around money. Um, and like I said, I think the the advantages we get on, on technology and, and dreaming about things we can't do and just kind of getting people excited about science, um, I think are well worth the, we, we, we invest, we invest money in all sorts of endeavors as a government. And, uh, and to me, this is one that, uh, has much more uh, ramifications than society-wise than just uh, you know four people going to the moon. I think there's so much we can learn and so much uh, that, it's, in my opinion, well worth it because it's such a minor on the overall budget that we spend. It's it's a minor. If we took the money from NASA and tried to throw it at some other problem, I, I don't think it's fixing whatever other problem you want to fix. So I, I don't see that as a. It, to me, it's not a not an issue and maybe that's an uh, element from that's the era I grew up in so I I'm a favor in favor of it but uh, um, I think it's <coughs> money well spent money well uh, well invested into the you know future scientists and all the other offshoots of science that get a benefit from that I think are well well worth it I uh, just uh, kind of to gauge uh, public awareness, for a couple of questions. Uh, what percentage of the federal budget do you think NASA's budget is? Oh, I looked it up once. It's uh, it's some per point point zero zero one percent of something, I think, is is my guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a little less than half of a percent. Less than half a percent, okay, yep. Yeah, and that's why I'm like, compared to all the other things we spend money on, uh, it's it's just a minor, it's a rounding error of, <laughs> if you think about your uh, bill at the restaurant, a half a percent is, is nothing when you're putting a tip on the bill. So it's just, it, yeah. people get people get blown away because, oh, we're gonna spend a million or a billion or something. But those, you know, we the, the government budget is trillions of dollars. And when you start doing the math on, on the, yeah, the one half of half a percent, it's it's nothing. So yeah. Uh, so if it was safe and affordable, would you take a trip to space? Absolutely. Yep. Affordable would be the key <laughs> in terms of that's why I said earlier on the if we got anywhere near uh, something that a you know regular average Joe could afford, I'd be I'd be first I'd be right there in line trying to sign up. So. Um, how far would you go? Would you uh, go to the moon? Would you immigrate to Mars? Uh, I'd probably start with the moon. Uh, Mars feels like a it's like, it's like a six month it's a six month one way trip, right? So 
Yeah, I think it's about uh, four months one way. Oh, but then you have months? to okay. stay there for like a year and a half to wait for the planets to realign to come back. Yeah, so it's a it's a two to three year commitment, right? Um, and that's the, that's the one that would scare me the most, I guess, at this point with still having a, a young one at home here uh, to have a three year gap when not seeing the family, that would be a tough one to tough one to swallow. The adventure part of me would go in a heartbeat, but the miss the family part would be, would be a tough one. That's why I, I'd be content with a, a week trip to the moon uh, would be enough to blow my mind, I think. So, although coming, <laughs> I don't know if I would qualify because when I think about skydiving, uh, that scares the heck out of me skydiving, <laughs> but I think uh, here you're in a suit skydiving? and you're buckled in and there's all kinds of safety things where skydiving, you're jumping out of a moving plane. <laughs> have, you, have you been skydiving? Uh, when I was younger, I had visions that uh, I, I got a buddy that went and he said, it, it, it'll blow your mind and it'll be the best experience you ever had. Um, it probably would, but I, as I've gotten older, I don't know if I get more scared of heights or just more fearful in general, or as we get older, I don't know if we get, more fearful or more cautious or but uh at this point i i would shy away from it maybe uh maybe as you get older kids are completely out of the house and i'm done working uh it might be something i would reconsider but at this point i'm scared <laughs> i understand well uh, jeff i know we talked about a lot of things but was there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch on um, do you, uh, is there a, do you know what the long term is? So 2025 is the target goal. Is there a, like there was Apollo 11, 12, 13, 14. Is there a plan to keep going then once we go or do they, is that locked down like once a year, or twice a year? Three, is there a, any kind of schedule that you're aware of or has that yeah, been determined I, yet or? No, they've, they've definitely uh, published a notional schedule. Uh, what they envision um you know essentially yearly missions uh, lasting longer having more extensive surface operations uh that's kind of you know the, the plan right now okay and i think the other question i had that you might have more visibility to now in your new role the when you look at some of the old technology from 1960s and you think about we probably have more computing power in our iphone now than they had in the entire you know, rocket in 1960, just on technology. Is there more thoughts that there's more safety or just because there's so much more technology and computing horsepower now than there was, is it 50 years ago? <laughs> is there uh, any no. thought that things are safer or there's more safety control? I mean, it's never going to be 100% foolproof, but is there more safety measures just because they have more technology to monitor more things or... I guess that would just be if you could comment on your thoughts on just the safety and the, the technology changes that are available now that just weren't there 50 years ago. Be yeah, curious I mean, to hear uh, your thoughts on, on that. Several things, you know, I mean, in Apollo, they had a one person in orbit and two on the surface. So if any of that one person in orbit needed anything, he didn't have any backup, you know? Right. So uh, sending four astronauts with two in orbit and two on the surface, you know, I, the best way to reduce your risk is to have a buddy. <laughs> yep, on uh, just about anything you do, yep. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, there's that. I think uh, another thing is um, our communications networks are way more robust. Um, you know, they're, the, the idea of having uh, all these stations around the Earth to, to kind of communicate to the moon, uh, you know, all that had to be built just for that purpose. But now we've been doing that with the International Space Station. We have so many satellites in orbit um so so you have that i think we know a lot more about the moon now a lot deeper resolution uh photos um the need for redundancy is i, I mean one other thing is you know back in apollo there was a lot of stress on the timeline you know trying to get there before the end of the decade um and I don't think you have quite the same drivers and that's both good and bad. Um, but, you know, means that we're not going until we're ready. 
yeah, from a safety standpoint, that should that should help things out from a sense of urgency. Or yeah, that was the <laughs> space race with the the USSR, right? That was the whole vision of we didn't want to get behind where they were at. So, um, so from a safety standpoint, do you know is there is there plans to uh, explore more of the moon because we've been on a very small chunk of the overall moon even with the missions we've already done right so is there plans to go to different areas now that we well the, well there are but um you know all of our previous missions were on the equatorial regions just because yep. they're easier to get to uh you know you have better communication with earth during the lunar daytime well no you just have better communication with earth um but uh this time my the focus is really on the lunar south pole where uh we've detected that there's vast amounts of uh, water ice and these permanently shadowed craters. So a lot of interest in, in that. And that's to help us understand, yeah, the history of, uh, was there, how was the moon formed or was the moon part of earth at one point and that split apart or all that whole? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, that water uh, is being viewed as a resource, you know, in terms of, You'll need water for your astronauts. You can use electrolysis to turn into hydrogen oxygen. You can breathe the oxygen. You can use the hydrogen oxygen to uh, uh, fuel your rocket. So. Um, oh, okay. I didn't realize we we're actually thinking we would use it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. You know, that way uh, you could make trips to the moon cheaper because you don't have to carry your fuel to come back. Yeah. Okay. That makes and, sense. And uh, potentially then you can use the moon as a hopping play, uh, off place for someplace else. Um, yeah, does it do anything to speed? If you take a, you get to the moon, you refuel, you're ready to go to launch from the moon to Mars. Does that change the... the no, level? you have the same sort of problem. You have the ISS, uh, it's the wrong plane. Oh, sure, yeah. But, but that water potentially could put in, um, could be launched to uh, fuel depots in Earth orbit uh, okay. and maybe uh, require a lot less energy uh, to launch them from the moon. On the initial, yeah. So. Okay. Interesting. Uh, one last question the, is the, the, with the old pod or anything coming back to Earth was always the uh, re entry and the the, the heat, uh, is the new module going to be roughly the same design in terms of coming back through the, the atmosphere in terms of uh, heat shield and all that type of, or have they gotten, is there any new ideas or designs around trying to make that easier or? Um, pretty much uh, they're working with the same you know, constraints and engineering understanding that they had before. So the, the shape of the return vehicle looks very similar to Apollo capsule. And okay. it has a blade of heat shield. Uh, and it, uh, it actually apparently will be um, even hotter than what uh, Apollo experienced. Mm. Okay. So. Did they, they got better at that or even, yeah, the stuff, the, Technology must have gotten better, or materials are better. Or the they learn things from the uh, the shuttle shuttle experience, right? So hopefully that's yeah. The the shuttle used um, ceramic tiles. Yeah. Uh, Apollo and Orion will both use an ablative heat shield. So the pretty much difference is with the ceramic tile. Um, that tile, uh, you know protects you from the heat uh, by just being a great heat insulator. Yep. The ablative heat shield, actually, as it gets hotter, it flecks away, taking the heat with it. OK. Um, uh, so so um, you know, the heat shield has to be recreated um, each okay. time. But I don't think they actually plan to reuse the Orion capsules itself. I think there's other parts of it, like the avionics that they plan to reuse. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of kind of interesting. It's, it, it looks very similar to the previous. Okay. 
the uh, the commercial, the Branson and the Bezos ones that are going up, they they don't get high enough that they have to deal with reentry or anything, right? So they don't have well, to deal with the heat shield stuff. Or it's not about how high you are, because you it's easy to get above the atmosphere, but you're just going to fall back down. And the thing is, is in order to stay in orbit, you have to be going so fast that as you fall towards the Earth, you you're moving further forward. You know, so you're your trajectory as you fall towards Earth kind of matches the curvature of the Earth, and you're essentially falling around the Earth because you're traveling ah, at 17,000 okay, miles. Yeah. yeah. As the Earth's going, you got to be it, as yeah. fast or faster to get through, right? Yeah. Well, and so um, to deorbit, you need to slow down. So it's all about, it, it's, they could carry fuel to slow down, but then you have to have fuel to carry that fuel and fuel to carry the fuel to carry the fuel. So it's just easier <laughs> yep. to use the atmosphere yep. to, to slow okay. down. So uh, Richard Branson and um, Blue Origin, uh, the new Shepard rocket at least, uh, only you know goes up above the atmosphere and comes back down, but never gets up to the 17,000 miles per hour that you need. OK. Yeah, sounds good. Well, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for participating in my project. Uh, um, yeah, no problem. It was exciting. Uh, very excited about you and your career. And it was fun to reminisce about uh, my memories of the space program. And I'm very excited about uh, the next couple of years. And definitely we'll keep in touch here as we uh, start hearing, uh, hearing more news. Absolutely. Well, you have a good rest of your evening. Great. Good luck with everything. We'll talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. See ya.